Welcome to another chapter in virtual book signing. We appreciate you all being online with us live. I'm Daniel Weinberg here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, as we always are, and we appreciate your being with us, and we have a crowd here today as well, which is very nice. Well, uh, very pleased to have Michael Burlingame, uh, an old friend with us. Uh, he's from, he, he already has uh, a degree from Princeton University, PhD from John Hopkins, and presently, I think since 1968, You've been a Professor Emeritus of History at Connecticut College. He's co-chair of the Connecticut Abraham Lincoln Bicentennial Commission and advisor to the Federal Commission. He serves on the Board of Directors of the Abraham Lincoln Association and the Abraham Lincoln Institute in Washington, D.C. He's a member of the Board of Advisors for the Abraham Lincoln Studies Center at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois. Now he's written and edited uh, and co-edited innumerable books, including <coughs> His first one, The Inner Work of Abraham Lincoln, uh, a fascinating portrait of Lincoln's personality. An Oral History of Abraham Lincoln in 96, won the Abraham Lincoln Association Award. In 1997, he co-edited Inside Lincoln's White House, The Complete Civil War Diary of John Hay, later expanded. Uh, he published Lincoln Observed, Civil War Dispatches with Noah Brooks. Lincoln's journalist, John Hay's anonymous writings for the press, 1860 to 64. In 2000, with Lincoln in the White House, letters, memoranda, and other writings of John G. Nicolay. Uh, in 2002, dispatches from Lincoln's White House, an anonymous Civil War journalism of uh, Presidential Secretary William O. Stoddard. Uh, then an expanded version of The Real Lincoln, a portrait of Jesse W. Week, uh, or is it White? White. And the Lincoln's Humor and Other ess Essays by Ben Thomas. Uh, and just more recently, Abraham Lincoln, the observations of John G. Nicolay and John Hay by SIU Press. Currently, he's working on a one-volume abridgment of the work we're going to talk about today. So the latest title is uh, this wonderfully massive work, uh, Abraham Lincoln, A Life by John Hopkins Press. It's four volumes in two, basically, and $125. Uh, I'm not sure why yours was just four volumes when Nicolay and Hay was 10. I'm not sure what you left out. Maybe I condensed can, it and condensed it and condensed it. What can I say? appreciate that. <laughs> uh, truly, this book is the first multi-volume biography since Sandberg, but uh, is meticulously researched and supersedes really all other Lincoln biographies in its detail. Uh, the future cannot look at Lincoln without using this book, and uh, no book can be written without using Michael's book at this point. And it's an essential title for the Lincoln Bookshelf and certainly for the Bicentennial. But don't be intimidated by how large it is. One versed in, uh, even in Lincoln, can dip into the work at any point and find new details that add depth to every story. And I think that's the point about this as well. It's not just a wonderful biography. I'm looking at this as a reference work that can be on the shelf. And you can go into it at any point and find uh, something new or interesting or, as I said, more in depth. But such things such as, we, I just picked one out, uh, the Committee of Seventy in, the, in that story mm -hmm. of Missouri uh, radicals who met with Lincoln in uh, September of 63. Now, most biographies would give perhaps one line or two lines to it, but you give three pages uh, and uh, a send-off for it as well. So if you have an interest in that, you can go right in the middle of the book and, and find out about it. So. Uh, Let's get into the 72,000 pages. I think it's getting <laughs> larger every time okay. of notes and okay. questions. As we always do, we ask the author to give us an idea of what brought you to this? Why this book? What did you see as necessary? And how did you get into it in the first place? And how did you approach the book as well? Mm -hmm. Well, when I wrote my first book, The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln, it's a series of psychological essays about Lincoln's relations with his parents, with his children, with his wife. Uh, his anger, his midlife crisis, things, just depressions, things of that sort. Uh, and uh, I was astonished when I did research on that book to discover lots of new information. I had assumed, falsely as it turned out, that everything important that, that Lincoln had ever said, that had been said about him, anything that he spoke, any uh, commentary on him had long since been unearthed and published in book form or article form. And I, could, and I drafted the book based on that assumption. 
But then I thought, well, I really should do some, some research in unpublished sources just in case there might be some new factual material that hadn't been unearthed previously by the legion of Lincoln scholars who had written about it. And so the very first day that I went out to do original research, uh, I left New London, Connecticut, where I had been teaching at Connecticut College, and went to Brown University about an hour up the road. And the first hour I was there, uh, I saw in the card catalog, you remember what a card catalog is? I've heard of it. I saw in the card catalog uh, a series of three by five cards describing in elaborate detail interviews that had been conducted by Lincoln's personal secretary, John G. Nicolay, with people who had known Lincoln very well. And this was 10 years, these interviews were conducted 10 years after the assassination, and they were full of new information. I just couldn't believe it. And uh, so I turned to the librarians and I said, you've done a marvelous job of indexing and cataloging these interviews, and nobody uses them. I can't believe it. I've never seen anybody refer to these. And then I published that subsequently, as a, those interviews as an oral history of Abraham Lincoln. And so I asked the librarian at Brown, why, why weren't people using this? And even people at Brown weren't using it. And I was told, well, Lincoln's a dead white male. Um, <laughs> professional historians these days are more interested in social history, history from the bottom up, um, and topics that get you, get you ahead in history departments are things like, well, homosexuality among 19th century Chinese pirates, <laughs> or, or uh, uh, cultural hegemony and the corset panic of 1921. Um, I'm, I'm not making these up. These are real topics. <laughs> right. um, and I said, well, okay. So I thought, gosh, uh, I bet you, uh, it's, and these interviews have been collected by Nicolay and conducted to help him with his biography. But then he decided, along with his co-author, John Hay, not to use them because they had exclusive access to Lincoln's personal papers and they said we'd prefer to use the contemporary documents rather than reminiscences and you do have to treat reminiscences with some care because uh, as Mark Twain once said the older I get the more vividly I remember things that never happened <laughs> so so you have to treat them carefully but uh, and it's better to rely on contemporary documents but re reminiscences can also be extremely valuable um, and so I thought these fellows went out and interviewed people who knew Lincoln. I bet you some of the other early biographers did that too. So I went out to the Ida Tarbell papers at Allegheny College in Meadville, Pennsylvania. And I spent a month in Meadville one week. And um, uh, <laughs> so was, there was a lot of good material in the Ida Tarbell papers. And so I, uh, that some of the material had shown up in her biography of Lincoln, but a lot of it didn't. And so I asked the librarians there, I said, I can't believe this is a treasure trove of information. I can't believe that it's not more widely cited. You almost never see these materials cited in the footnotes of Lincoln books. And she said, well, you're the first person who spent more than a day looking at this stuff since I've been here for the past 30 years. And uh, so I came out to here to Chicago and looked at papers at the University of Chicago and at the Newberry and at the what was then called the Chicago Historical Society and found all kinds of new stuff of reminiscent materials. And I thought, my goodness. Um, and then I thought, this, ought, this material ought to be incorporated into a new cradle-to-grave biography of Lincoln. And because Sandberg hadn't had access to these materials. Sandberg, for example, didn't even have access to the Lincoln papers at the Library of Congress. Lincoln's incoming mail and drafts of his letters and drafts of his speeches, those weren't open to the public till 1947. And Sandberg published his four-volume study of the Lincoln and the War Years in 1939. And of course, since Sandberg published in 1939, a lot of Civil War scholars had done tremendous new work, and uh, Lincoln monographs uh, did a lot of good work. And I thought those uh, sources of new information should be incorporated too. And the Lincoln legal papers were about to be published um, in the year 2000, and that allowed us to say things about Lincoln the lawyer that you couldn't have said before. So I thought somebody really ought to get all this information and put it together in a new cradle-to-grave multi-volume biography. And I looked around and, and asked myself and, and asked others, so are you going to do it? And, and Jim McPherson and other leading historians would have been ideal candidates for it. And my own mentor, the, the man whom I studied with both as an undergraduate at Princeton and then as a graduate student at Johns Hopkins, David Donald, well, he wrote a one-volume biography of Lincoln. And I thought, well, a, a more detailed volume uh, or series of volumes is called for. And so nobody seemed to be willing to do it. And so uh, in 1997, I signed a contract to do it and uh, with some trepidation, I might add. Uh, and for 11 years, I've been having the sort of Damocles hang over my head. And uh, so I, I've, I finally got it done. And, and uh, 
made it in time for the bicentennial. And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, I felt a sense of relief, which was akin to the sense of relief that the editor of the Alexander Hamilton papers felt at the end of his work. And after editing 20 volumes, he was asked how he felt, and he said, well, the thought that's foremost in my mind now that it's all done is thank God for Aaron Burr. <laughs> uh, I, I hasten to add that I do not feel that way about John Wilkes Booth. So that's, that's the basic story about how I, I came to write it. All right. Well, as I've said before, and I just said a few minutes ago, too, we don't mind Booth so much because there is now an Abraham Lincoln bookshop <laughs> from martyrdom. Now, you call yourself a psychohistorian. That's one, one word. One word. Right, I know. Right, I one word. <laughs> to add that. There are psychohistorians. Those are two words. But I, I flatter myself that I don't belong to that category. Now, how does, then, you talked about memory. Uh, how does participant memory affect the, re the reliability in your research? And is emotional memory not part of that and maybe more lasting than actual memory? What I'm talking about is that um, sometimes, for instance, I, we, it, here at the bookshop we can, we can show artifacts, but someone just bought the artifact I, I needed right now uh, just for lucre. But nonetheless, uh, it was Holland's book uh, on Lincoln just after the war and Ward Lamon's copy. And he had some marginalia that he put oh, in there. Oh, really? He, exactly. And uh, in there, uh, he remembered certain things about Lincoln. And, it, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit later on as well. But what about memory, especially long after the fact? And does sometimes the emotion remember? Yes, I remember he or she was like that, although the facts are warped. Uh, right. Oftentimes, reminiscences many years after the event get details wrong, dates wrong, um, sometimes names wrong. Uh, but, all, but the general gist of what they have to say is oftentimes corroborated by contemporary documents and, and other reminiscences of people who lived at that time who weren't collaborating with the people who were sharing that reminiscence with you. So you have to use those materials carefully and you try to use as many contemporary documents as you can to corroborate the reminiscences of the people who, whose uh, recollections you're relying on. But sometimes there just are no such contemporary documents. For example, uh, what we know about Lincoln's years in Kentucky, where he spent his first seven years, and then his subsequent 14 years in Indiana from the age of seven to the age of 21, we have virtually nothing in the way of contemporary documents. We have a great treasure trove of reminiscences that Lincoln's law partner, William Herndon, accumulated shortly after the assassination. And that archive of Herndon reminiscences used to be regarded as a, as a kind of nuclear waste dump. Uh, of historians shied away from it because it was supposed to be uh, these Alzheimer's patients drooling on their walkers and, and making up stories out of whole cloth. And that's, that image of the Herndon archive had been perpetrated by James G. Randall, who was my mentor's mentor. Um, and so when I first looked at the Herndon archive, uh, I, I came uh, with a prejudice against it, saying, well, these, these are untrustworthy reminiscences, untrustworthy reminiscences, but as I read through them, and in those days they were only available on microfilm, which was a challenge, um, as I read through them, I said, that these don't seem to me to be uh, far-fetched, and Herndon doesn't seem to be asking leading questions, and um, these, these all sound plausible to me, and when, when <coughs> Herndon finds some contradictory uh, testimony, he goes back like a good lawyer and, and cross-examines the, the folks who shared reminiscences with him. And so um, I decided to go ahead and use much of that material. And I thought I was going to get crucified by the reviewers because I was using the Herndon archive. But my book came out in 94, my first book, The Inner World of Abraham Lincoln, which I wanted to call Shrinkin' Lincoln. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, luckily, two very fine historians out here in Illinois, John Y. Simon, the late John Y. Simon, and uh, Douglas L. Wilson, uh, who's at uh, the Knox College Lincoln Study Center, published articles on the Herndon archive and the Ann Rutledge story saying that, that the archive was really trustworthy and the Ann Rutledge story really did happen. And uh, so uh, the, those articles helped um, uh, shield me from the criticism that I had anticipated.